I speak to you today in the name of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. Good morning, and a blessed All Saints Day to you. You know, I've always loved the creative ways we find to approach this holy day. When I was a curate at All Saints Kingsway, Naturally, we took our name day very seriously, and I was honored with the task of helping our youth group to explore it. And I thought I was very clever about the whole thing. I assigned roles of popular saints to several adults in the congregation and gave them a page of information to share about their saints. They dressed in long black robes and hid all over the sanctuary, the nave and the balcony. Now I warned the kids that we were about to go in search of important saints, that they would be dead, but that they were willing to tell us about their lives. So we crept around the dark church and one by one, each saint would light their candle and raise it up so we could find them and spend some time with them. Pretty cool, right? What could go wrong? But here's where it gets interesting. <laughs> I had found the candles for the saints in the sacristy, and I didn't even think about asking permission to use them, and guess which ones I got? They were these great, big, thick, expensive candles that we use for the liturgy. (laughs) To say that I was in trouble would be an understatement, and I can't even imagine how much that cost the parish. But we had a great time anyway exploring the All Saints Day, and I was eventually forgiven. All Saints, though, for many of us, as I said, can be bittersweet. It's both lovely and hard to think of the ones who have died, and yet it's also a good, life-giving thing to do. There's a healing component to the rituals that we humans engage in to mark the passing of our loved ones. And right here today, we are going to keep important, precious memories alive by Stuart will be speaking the names of our loved ones here who have gone before us and marking the moment with special honors and music. For centuries, people have created ways to deal with the pain of loss, to learn to let go, and to move forward into a future that celebrates the ones we miss and yet still allows those of us left behind to live a full right life around their grief. Because it doesn't go away, but we learn to live with it and around it. The working of The the work of coming to terms with life and death is nothing new. It's been important and necessary in all times, places, and cultures. And it's really interesting to look around and to see how other people approach it. Something I noticed as a very young child was how different my father's Amish Mennonite people handled death as compared to my mother's side, who were wealthy Canadian business people. I had a first-hand experience of it when my grandma Susanna, after whom I'm named, passed away when I was only six years old. The casket was brought to the farmhouse where our whole extended family stayed for weeks. Every evening, people from the neighborhood, the farms around and from the church would come and they'd come without calling. They would show up with massive casseroles and folding chairs from the church and the living room was filled to capacity every evening. They would tell stories about my grandma, many that I'd never heard before. They would laugh really loud at the funny parts. They'd cry without reservation when they felt the sadness. They would touch her hands and her face in the open casket, and it was all really natural for them. They didn't protect their children from death. They brought them along to experience the whole ride. We would eat, sing, laugh and cry all together until the day of the funeral. And during the funeral, it was kind of the same. We would laugh and cry and pray. We released her into God's hands. We released her to the earth. And then we ate some more. And food continued to arrive at the farmhouse for weeks. 
From the moment Grandma died, it was a natural, organic event where the whole community participated and surrounded our family, and nobody was ever embarrassed about crying. I noticed that after the funeral, some of the women were speculating about who Grandpa might marry next. And you must understand that the Amish are a very practical people. They, it was no joke for them. So like most widows and widowers in that community, he was happily remarried within a year. But I think that the, his ability to be able to let go and move on was because of not being afraid of the grief, not being afraid to cry with his friends. Now this was all in stark contrast to my mother's people, God bless them, who seemed to see, see any death, even of the very old members of the family, as a shocking tragedy. They would never cry in public. They would never express their feelings. The body was removed immediately, and friends would never think of intruding on their privacy by dropping in, or even phoning. The funeral chapel was set up in a way that separated the grieving family from the rest of the congregation, with what they called a grieving gallery off to the side of the platform so that if any of the family did break down, nobody in the congregation would see their tears because there was a wall coming out halfway to protect them. God forbid they should be seen crying about their loved one. People spoke in whispers at the reception, and I realized that what was missing was the joyful celebration of the loved one's life. After the funeral, the people were expected to get on with things right away, almost immediately. In other words, their grief, while just as deep as anyone else's, was minimized and downplayed because it made people uncomfortable. So as a kid observing these two cultures and their ways of handling death, I saw that the one side expressed their grief and accepted the love and care of the community, while the other side kept grief to themselves and handled it all alone for the most part. And I saw the tragic difference for those poor souls who carried their grief alone, deeply buried inside. Now these experiences of mine are two extremes, I grant you. And we all come from diverse families with many traditions, some helpful, some less helpful, all somewhere on the scale of, of what's good and what's helpful. But I think it's important for us to be aware of our relationship with the fact of death and the presence of death, which will always be near. Our Christian tradition for all saints, as, so, as is so often the case, is not isolated in history. There's a very similar pagan tradition called Sowin. Sowin is a Gaelic word for an ancient Celtic spiritual tradition celebrated at this time of year to mark the end of harvest and to usher in the dark half of the year. Now they believed that the barriers between our physical world and the world of the saints who have gone before us breaks down during this time, allowing a more sensitized connection, not spooky, <laughs> not scary, but a more sensitized connection between the living and the souls who have passed. But if we think this is something that's far in the ancient murky past, we need to think again. The interesting thing about this and other similar traditions is that these sensibilities have survived down through the centuries, and they still pop up in surprising places in modern times. If you ever saw the lovely film, The Secret of Rowan Inish, you'll remember that the grandmother, a devout practicing Roman Catholic Christian, always also whispered ancient Irish prayers to protect the household from the many superstitions that people still carried in their DNA. And I remember an old Scottish aunt a Plymouth Brethren Chapel Christian, no less, talking about the thin places, places and times where the boundaries between the living and the dead seemed blurred, thinned, when it just felt like there was less of a barrier there. But what about you and me, the Christians gathered here today for All Saints Day? 
Where do our sensibilities lie as Christ followers here in this place? We know that naming our departed loved ones and celebrating them is important. So we find excellent ways to honor them as we will soon see. But like my Mennonite relatives, we do not bring fear into the picture. Today's scriptures guide us beautifully into the resurrection hope that sustains us in our grief and in our relationship with life and with death. And I know that's easy to say, and yet it becomes only too real when we're actually faced with loss. Now, I've talked about resurrection hope for years, but when my mom and my dad and my only sister all died around 2019, within 18 months of one another, I was pretty knocked out for a while. But still, the fact that they were not gone, but belonged to God in a new way, always brings me healing. We all have our stories of loss, every one of us sitting here today. And today we join Jesus and a few of his best friends in the middle of their story. It's interesting that just before this encounter Jesus has with Mary, her sister Martha had run down the road to meet him as soon as he approached. They both said the same sort of thing. Martha said, Lord, if only you had been here, Lazarus wouldn't have died. Jesus' answer was, I am the resurrection and the life. And this was an image of which she had some understanding. But quite honestly, a future resurrection on the last day wasn't doing it for her at the moment. She wanted her brother back. And so did Mary, who, like Martha, laid it all on Jesus the moment he arrived. If only you'd come sooner, my brother would still live. New Testament professor Caroline Lewis wonders if Jesus' tears at that point were about Lazarus, his good friend, or also about the fact that death is inevitable for all of us, all of us humans. Perhaps she muses that Jesus was lamenting the grief that we would all have to carry, that we all have had to carry down through the ages when we face the death of our loved ones and when we face our own death. It's interesting that Mary and Martha and lots of their fr friends lay the full load on Jesus. Some of them say, well, if this guy just restored that blind man's sight, why on earth could he not have kept Lazarus from dying? And of course, he did raise Lazarus, but the crazy thing in the back of all of our minds is that some years later, Lazarus did die. He died a natural death along with every other character in the story, because that's what we humans do. We are born, and we live, and we die. We can only return to our biblical images to find meaning and purpose in all of this. The prophet Isaiah paints a picture for us of a glorious heavenly banquet to which we're all invited, where the wine is excellent, that pleases me, the food is the best, and the energy is life-giving. There's no room for doubt here. In this promise, God will swallow up death forever and wipe away our disgrace along with our tears. According to Isaiah, we will be free from the power that death had over us. We're not magically turned into vampires that will last forever, thank goodness. We will still die, but it's the power of death the sting of death from which we're released. Because death cannot end us. Quite simply, my friends, death will not end us. And the beautiful words in Revelation weave a story of the new heaven and the new earth when the God of love makes a home right here with us, right here in this messy reality of our daily lives. And again, we hear that God, close beside us, will wipe away every tear from our eyes, that death, crying and pain, will be no more. And here's what gets to me every time. The one on the throne, the one who is the beginning and the end, says, see, I am making all things new. We hear these words at many of our funerals, and it makes sense, because this is the very hope 
from which we find our strength, both in life and in death. And this isn't just some encouraging memo that God sends us. Rather, it's an invitation to come in close, to participate in God's intentional work of making all things new. You are, and I are invited, expected, to be passionately engaged in that work. That beautiful heavenly banquet becomes more visible and more real here among us with every act of loving compassion that we extend to the people God puts in front of us in the pathway, making all things new. You know, today's story isn't just about Lazarus. It includes all of the ones who are grieving, the sisters, the friends, in shock, in tears, mourning their loss. It makes space then for you and me and the grief that we have to face. And it shows us the importance of being surrounded by the love and support of the community when we have loss. And here we are today as a community, gathered with love around those who have gone before us, remembering together and holding one another up in love. Friends, Jesus acknowledges and enters into our grief. He cries with us beside the grave. We all know that when we lose a loved one, when we face our, more, our own mortality, it's not easy. There are no magic words to make the pain disappear, to make the fear go away. It's deeply human. Yet still we sing our songs. Still through our tears, we rejoice in the resurrection hope that is our very foundation, that releases us from fear and despair. And when I die, they will gather around me and say, all of us go down to the dust, and yet even at the grave, we make our song. Say it with me, Alleluia, Alleluia, Alleluia. Be not afraid, I go before you always, come follow me, and I will give you rest. Thanks be to God. Amen.